Hello and welcome. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever time of day you're watching. Today is Advent Sunday, the first day of Advent and the first day of the Church's New Year. Advent is a season that runs up to Christmas. And the word Advent means coming to. It's a season when we think of the coming of Jesus to us. Firstly, in his birth at Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. Then, his promised second coming, when he will come back in all his glory and his kingdom will be fully here. And thirdly, the fact that Jesus promises to come into our lives and hearts each hour of each day, if we let him. During the season of Advent, many of you will see an Advent wreath, a circle of evergreen with four candles and one in the centre. The circle is a figure that has no beginning and no end, which reminds us that God's love has no beginning and no end. It's always there for us. The evergreen foliage Foliage from trees that don't appear to die in winter, but appear to be always alive. And this reminds us of the gift of eternal life, everlasting life. The four candles, one for each of the Sundays of Advent, remind us of certain aspects, important aspects or people in our faith. The names of them vary. We use Hope, peace, joy, and love. Candles are lit the first one this Sunday, and then another one each successive Sunday. On Christmas Day, the centre white candle is lit. The candle that represents Jesus, the Christ child, the light of the world. So, let us light our first candle. candle for hope and we pray Lord we thank you for the gift of hope hope that your promises will be fulfilled we pray for all of those throughout the world who so badly need to hear the message of hope Amen and our call to worship Words from the end of the book of Revelation. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So let us worship God. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. That mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Oh, come, O oh come. On Sinai's height, in ancient times didst give the Lord in cloud and majesty and all. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee. Satan's tyranny From 
depths of hell thy people save And give them victory o'er the grave Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Spirits by thine advent Disperse the gloomy clouds of night And death's dark shadows put to flight Rejoice, rejoice Emmanuel shall come to thee David, come and open wide our heavenly home. Make safe the way that leads on high and close the path to misery. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. Risk-taking God, you came into the world powerless, bound by Jewish law, oppressed by foreign rulers, a vulnerable child in a dangerous world, and yet you embraced our human life. You shared in our vulnerability. You were not afraid by the lack of power, by the binding of your law, or the dangerous world you lived in. Jesus you lived an honest, humble life, fully human and aware of the risks of this life. You learnt the laws of your people. You spent time in prayer. You used your power to help people break free from pain, illness, oppression, injustice and inequality. May we choose to live life fully, taking calculated risks to speak truth to power, breaking bonds that are unfair or abusive, and committing to living your law of love each day, building your topsy-turvy kingdom one day at a time. Lord God, help us to be more like Jesus, taking calculated risk when we can, creating a world of love and light. Amen. Our first reading today is from Genesis, Genesis 38, verses 13 to 19, and then 24 to 27. When Tamar was told, your father-in-law is on his way to Timnah to shear a sheep, she took off her widow's clothes, covered herself with a veil to disguise herself, and sat down at the entrance to Naim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that though Shelah had now grown up, she had not been given to him as his wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. Not realising that she was his daughter-in-law, he went over to her by the roadside and said, Come now, let me sleep with you. And what will you give me to sleep with you? she asked. I'll send you a young goat from my flock he said. Will you give me something as a pledge until you send it? she asked. He said, what pledge should I give you? Your seal and its cord and the staff in your hand, she answered. So he gave them to her and slept with her and she became pregnant by him. After she left, she took off her veil and put on her widow's clothes again. About three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law, Tamar, is guilty of prostitution 
and as a result, she is now pregnant. Judah said, bring her out and have her burned to death. As she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law. I am pregnant by the man who owns these things, she said. And she added, see if you recognise whose seal and cord and staff these are. Judah recognised them and said, she is more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her my son Shelah, and he did not sleep with her again. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The second reading is from Luke, Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. The birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Amen. And may God bless these readings of his holy word. Do not be afraid, God is here.
The gospel account we've just heard is probably a familiar story to many. The visit of the angel Gabriel to Mary. The annunciation of the coming of Jesus, of the incarnation. The coming in human flesh of God the Son. It can seem like the beginning of the story of Jesus coming to earth, the Christmas story. But in fact, that story started far, far earlier. For centuries, the people of Israel had looked for the promised Messiah, someone who would save them from their enemies, lead them to victory. Over the centuries, their prophets had spoken words of hope, words about a Messiah. They looked back to the promises, the covenant made between God and Abraham, the promise of a special relationship, a blessing on Abraham and his descendants, that God would be their God and that they would be his special people. The promise that the land of Canaan would be given to Abraham and to his descendants as an everlasting possession, their promised land. A land that at the time of the Gospel passage was yet again under foreign occupation. They looked back to the covenant made between God and King David, a descendant of Abraham. A promise that his line would rule forever. But at the time of the Gospel passage, no king of David's line sat on the throne. Yet these centuries of expectation, of hope, were about to be fulfilled, but not in the way that they expected. No great military leader, but a small baby. Mary would have shared this expectation, hope of a Messiah, but little would she have realised that she had a part to play in this. The hope she held in her heart that day, before the angel appeared, would probably have been about her forthcoming marriage. Yes, also about having and bringing up children, but after the marriage, with Joseph as father. Then, as God can so often do, he breaks into her life in a dramatic fashion, totally unexpected fashion. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. The message was overawing. I wonder what Mary's first thoughts were. That this child would not be the result of the consummation of her marriage with Joseph? I wonder if in the split second after the angel's announcement, Mary saw all her hopes of marriage and children with Joseph disappearing. She responds, by asking the angel a totally reasonable question. How's this going to happen? I'm a virgin. Mary trusts in the angel's reply that God can do anything and she accepts God's plans for her future. That was a tremendous act of faith. Potentially giving up all her hopes for a future with Joseph. Of course, that didn't actually happen, but she wouldn't have known it at the time. But to go back to the expectations and hopes of the people, a king from the line of David. Genealogies, ancestors, lines of descent, where people came from, was certainly very important to the people of Israel, God's chosen people. 
They were descended from Abraham by his son Isaac and grandson Jacob. They had had a great king, David, king in the glory days of Israel, when Israel was the power in the region. And God had promised that David's kingly line would last forever. Matthew and Luke both include details of the human lineage of Jesus. As was the custom, the lineage is traced through the male line, that is, Joseph's, which can obviously raise certain questions. But Joseph was seen as Jesus' father and was his legal father. Joseph, with his wife Mary, raised the child Jesus. There are some differences between the two genealogies. Matthew mentions some women in the family line. Only four, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth and the wife of Uriah, that is Bathsheba. Four women compared with 40 men. Matthew's genealogy starts with Abraham and its main purpose seems to be show clearly that Jesus was descended from Abraham and from King David, born into the kingly line. Now, there were obviously women involved at each generation. So why are these four women named? There were several different ideas about this. Firstly, that they appear at important parts of the story of, Jesus, of Israel. Tamar, who is mentioned in our first reading, appears as a link to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, in that Judah, the father of her children, was a son of Jacob. Rahab, if the same Rahab as is mentioned in the book of jo Joshua, is closely connected with the conquest of the promised land. Ruth was great-grandmother of King David. Bathsheba was a wife of David, a mother of Solomon who succeeded David and carried on his line. A second idea is that they show that salvation was for all people, not just for the Israelites. The Rahab mentioned in Joshua was a Canaanite. Ruth was from Moab. People have surmised that Tamar and Bathsheba may also have been foreigners. One early document does say that Tamar was also a Canaanite, but we don't know for certain. A third idea links strongly with Jesus being Saviour, which is the meaning of the name Jesus, the name that both Mary and Joseph was told that the child should be given. Not the hoped-for military leader, saving his people from human foes, but God's own Son, who would and does deliver us, save us, from all that separates us from God. To save mankind from our waywardness, our sins, when Jesus became incarnate, he was born into a line of wayward, sinful humans in order to take upon himself the sins of mankind. The four women named are connected with people, events and behaviours which demonstrate this waywardness, this sinfulness. The story of Tamar and Judah which we heard. Judah has various shortcomings recorded in the Bible, including not fulfilling his obligations to make Tamar wife of his son Shelah. Tamar had not been treated correctly and resorted to trickery to achieve her ends. In the life world of her time, she would not have had the range of options that many modern women have. She was not, however, destitute, living in her father-in-law's house as a widow. Judah said that Taman was more righteous than he was. Judah was certainly found wanting in his behaviour. People will have different views as to whether Tamar's trickery was justified. 
the Rahab mentioned in Joshua was possibly a prostitute. Ruth joined Boaz as he slept. David slept with Bathsheba while she was married to Uriah and subsequently had Uriah murdered to cover up his sin. Scripture does not say if Bathsheba was a willing or unwilling participant. There are, of course, many other examples of waywardness, sinfulness in the generations where no woman is named. If the Annunciation was not the beginning of the story of Jesus coming to earth, neither is the first Easter, the cross and resurrection, the end of that story. Jesus' saving work goes on as he works through his body, the church, as he works in each one of us. No matter who we are, where we are, or what we have done, Jesus holds out his hand to us to bring us to his Father, his Father, who Jesus said is also our Father, a loving Father who longs for us to turn to him. Jesus' saving work will go on until he returns in glory at the end times when all will be gathered together in true communion with our loving Father, Jesus' second coming. Advent is a time when in awe and wonder we give thanks for Jesus' first coming in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. It is a time when we particularly look forward in hope to his glorious second coming. It is a time when we day by day open our hearts to Jesus, his everyday coming. Let us take time this Advent to ponder the wonder of Jesus coming in flesh, the wonder that Jesus wants to be with us in our hearts every hour of every day, and the wonder of the great hope he's given us that he will come again when his kingdom will be established in its fullness. And let us share the good news of that hope, of God's love and forgiveness, that is a way home to God's kingdom for all. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Loving God, as our northern hemisphere grows dark, as winter takes hold and days are short, we are grateful for some hours of sunlight each day, a reminder that your light can never be put out. As we use artificial light to bring warmth and comfort to these Advent days, we are glad to remember that the light of the world is already here and will never leave us. Jesus, light of the world, have mercy on us. Hear our prayers for the world and help us to listen for your answers. We pray for anyone who feels powerless within their homes, work or community life. May they find opportunities and people to help them. We pray for anyone who feels bound to another person or a situation which they are un unable to break free from. May they find strength to endure and people to assist them. We pray for anyone who is trying to follow in the way of Jesus, whatever their situation or circumstances. May they know your love surrounding them and people to encourage and support them. Jesus, light of the world, have mercy on us. We pray for all those with a responsibility for lawmaking. May they seek to create laws that are just and fair. We pray for all those who feel the law is binding them against their will and are struggling to change the law. We pray for all those who seek to undermine and ignore the law for selfish greed and desire. May they realise their errors and seek to turn from them. Jesus, light of the world, have mercy on us. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world, each one trying to follow in the way of Jesus, each one empowered bound and committed to God. May they know your peace and guiding light in these Advent days. Jesus, light of the world, have mercy on us. 
We pray for anyone searching for you this Advent. May they find you in all places and people and come to love and follow you. Jesus, light of the world, have mercy on us. Amen. We come to our offerings. Lord, we offer you ourselves, who we are and what we have, that through your Spirit we might bring hope into our communities and into the world. Accept us and accept our gifts for the service of your kingdom. Amen. And we draw our prayers together in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. Lift up your eyes and look for him, Jesus the coming Saviour King, born to redeem the world from sin, bringing his peace to all. Now if you walk in darkest night, look for his dawn that's breaking bright, Nothing shall ever stop this light Bringing new hope to all Oh, lift up your eyes, see the King Worship the Saviour, come praise Him Jesus the Lord of
As we come to the end of our service of worship, let us pray. God of hope, be with us on our Advent journey to the stable and beyond. May we always rejoice in your presence with us as we await the fulfilment of your kingdom when you return in glory. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us, with all whom we love and with all God's children everywhere. Amen. Thank you to Jean, Jade and Lynn for leading us in our worship today. Can I remind you all of the Advent adventure beginning at four o'clock on Sunday the 27th of November. Details at aksm.org.uk forward slash adventure. And for details of all that's happening around the peninsula and indeed online, you can go to www.peninsulachurches.org.uk.